Hi, my name is Kim Eagle for ACC.org. I'm delighted to be coming to you today from ACC 24. This is day three of this meeting, which has all kinds of wonderful clinical trials that are certainly, I think, practice changing. Uh, on this particular day, we identified several important trials that we want to talk to you about. I'm joined by three experts in the science of clinical trials, Pyle Coley from Denver, Colorado, Ajay Kirtani from New York City, and Darum Kambani from Dallas, Texas. We're going to start with a trial called Target BP. Ajay, take it away. Well, first, it's been a fantastic ACC, and the day keeps days keep coming with great trials. And Target BP was uh, long awaited because now there's a lot of energy in the renal denervation space. As you know, renal denervation is a therapy that can be used to treat patients with uncontrolled hypertension to approved devices already. And this is now a third device with a different mechanism of action. Uh, the Peregrine device is a device that aims to treat with alcohol to denature uh, the renal nerves and therefore cause a reduction in blood pressure. The initial trial with this device, which was published not too long ago, was an off-med study design. So patients taken off their medications, randomly assigned to um, this device versus a sham control, and there was no appreciable difference in clinical outcomes. But this trial was a larger trial, 300 patients, and um, build the FDA approval trial for this device. And what was shown is that there was a reduction, a greater reduction in blood pressure with this device compared to a sham control, continuing the theme of sham controlled randomized trials within the real denervation space. Interestingly, the blood pressure dropped in both groups. And whenever the blood pressure drops in the sham group, one always thinks that that must be due to increased medications that are somehow taken. But despite that noise in the background, one could discern a treatment effect in favor of the renal denervation device. The average blood pressure reduction was 3.2 millimeters of mercury in ambulatory blood pressure. Um, interestingly, there were no differences in office blood pressure, perhaps due to this confounding effect of medications. So overall, the effect is, as the authors describe it, a modest effect. Um, I think this is what we're seeing across the board with renal denervation devices. This difference is perhaps even less than was seen with some of the other devices out there. And so it'll be an interesting one for the FDA to determine whether this could lead to a third device approval within the space. Nonetheless, I think the proof of concept of renal denervation remains alive and well with the results of this trial. And for that, the investigators ought to be commended. Yeah, I, I agree with your analysis, and I, I think that uh, this will represent a strategy that we can use in some patients. Uh, we're still teasing out who those patients are and whether we can reduce uh, the number of classes of medications they might need, particularly those who have side effects or seem to be sort of allergic to taking medications. Uh, this strategy uh, certainly looks like it will have potential in at least some of our patients. Now, Darren, you've been dedicated to the clinical trial space with ACC.org for a long time now. And this is, there's a trial being presented today called Dedicate, which uh, I'm dedicating to you. Tell us about that trial. Yeah, that's very kind. Thanks, Artigo. So, yeah, so um, Dedicate was, um, uh, is uh, a very interesting trial. This was done um, uh, in, in Germany. Um, now, you know, as we know, TAVR has now become sort of the dominant um, way in which patients with Severe symptomatic aortic stenosis are being treated. In the United States alone, you know, close to 100,000 TAVRs um, are being done annually. Um, but the question has, uh, in the field has been, you know, when you look at low intermediate risk patients, um, you know, all the studies that have been done have uh, been uh, A, sponsored by industry primarily, and B, they've been very device specific. And so what they really wanted to assess is if we took all comers coming in um, who are low intermediate risk, uh, and then we use kind of, you know, whatever device the physician thought was best for them, you know, how does TAVR compare with TAVR? So that was kind of the setup of this. And they included um, 1,404 patients, uh, and they were equally randomized with two arms. Now, uh, TAVR was done with a balloon expandable valve in about two-thirds uh, of the patients, and then one-third received the uh, self-expanding valve. And the, the TAVR practice was very contemporary, you know, the majority, 97 98% was transfemoral, you know, conscious sedation in about uh, three-fourths of the patients, and embolic protection devices were used in about 5% of TAVR patients. And then SAVR treatment um, was also very contemporary, um, and standard valves were used in the majority of patients. Um, now, the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality or disabling stroke, and this, uh, interestingly, was significantly better uh, in the TAVR round compared with um, SAVR, a reduction of, um, you know, 47%. Um, and there was also a significant reduction in all-cause mortality at 12 months in favor of TAVR, and separately a reduction in disabling stroke. 
So this suggests uh, that at one year, you actually had a significantly better uh, risk um, or you had significantly better outcomes with TAVR compared with SAVR. Some of the other things that we've seen play out, such as, you know, a need for pacemaker, um, you know, uh, moderate to severe PDL, which was around 3 to 4%. Um, those were all higher in TAVR. We've seen that. And on the other side, you know, things like bleeding, post-operative AFib, length of stake, those were all higher in the, in the patients who underwent SAVR. So I think the long-term follow-up um, of this study will be very important. They do present one-year hemodynamic data, um, and those appear to be very similar. But I think, of course, you know, with these patients um, who um, you know, have a much longer life expectancy, we would need to see longer-term data. So this is a great first step. Um, we really needed this trial, and I think we'll need to see sort of what the long-term data shows. This, along with other data, you know, uh, other data in lower-risk patients that is being accrued, but, um, you know, so um, uh, this really adds to, I think, uh, the current database or current literature that's available uh, comparing these two therapies. Thank you, Darren. Totally agree with your analysis. Obviously, TAVR has changed uh, the lives of so many people around the world. And uh, we continue to add knowledge that helps us be very specific in planning care for our patients uh, and their families. This is another uh, wonderful trial. Uh, do we revascularize all the coronary bed and STEMI, or should we just do the culprit vessel? This has been a vexing question for us for a long time now. And there's a really nice trial at this meeting called Full Revask. Kyle, t- tell us about that trial. It's the million dollar question that you just asked, Kim. And really, there's so much clinical equipoise when it comes to this question, because we know that about half of STEMI patients who come in obviously have non culprit lesions that are angiographically similar. There's also a few recent randomized trials that have sort of pushed us towards a complete revascularization. The first of those was the complete trial, which had STEMI patients with angiographic guided complete revask, showed a statistically significant 26% reduction in CV death or new MI. And then following that, there was the Bayer trial, which was in older patients over the age of 75, which had a physio- physiologic guided complete revascularization that also showed a 36% reduction in CV death or new MI. So this trial sort of tried to push it a little farther and said, instead of CV death, let's look at all cause death uh, and unplanned revascularizations and MI as the primary endpoint. And this was a mix of STEMI and and non-STEMI, mostly STEMI, about 8 to 9% very high risk non-STEMI patients, uh, followed for 4.8 years. So nice long follow-up. Now, the initial trial plan sort of went awry because they had planned to have over 4,000 patients to have an 80% power to detect a significant reduction in that composite primary endpoint. When complete came out, then they were told, hey, you better stop enrollment because it's not ethical to continue enrollment when we have a trial that's already suggesting benefit. So they actually had to stop enrolling after about 1,542 patients. So much less than their anticipated sample size, about half as much. And the reason I bring that up is because the primary endpoint, which was all cause death, MI or unplanned revask was negative, but some of the secondary endpoints, which was cardiovascular death, kind of similar to the ones that have been done before, did come close to the line of immunity. They crossed, so not statistically significant, but numerically, those came out much lower. And not surprisingly, if you're fixing all the lesions at the time of the index event, your planned or unplanned revasks actually went down by about 41%. So even though this was a negative trial, to me, it does sort of tell me a little bit more about how complete revascularization might work in you know, in the setting of the index event. But I think this was a power issue, and that's maybe why that primary endpoint came out negative. I also think it was a slightly different primary endpoint, all-cause death rather than CV death as some of the other trials had done. So I'm gonna continue pushing my lipid lowering therapy because I know that works to stabilize the culprit and the non-culprit plaque. But I'm curious what Ajay, who's an interventional colleague of mine, how this might affect his clinical practice. No, I would just say, Pyle, you can scrub in the cath lab anytime because that was a phenomenal summary. And I think it is unfortunate the trial was not fully powered, but there are enough signals here in this trial that I don't think it's gonna move the needle very much and complete will probably stand as probably the definitive study until complete two comes out. So for sure, great summary. Excellent. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, uh, Pyle. Well, ACC 24 is a wonderful meeting. I I really want to thank Darum, Pyle, and Ajay for helping us cover the key late breakers that are uh, being presented today, day three uh, in Atlanta. We're so fortunate and privileged to be able to provide information to you 
on acc.org. Uh, to be part of your learning environment is a privilege for all of us. Uh, and from all of our team, we want to hope that you've had a great meeting and look forward to the next time. This is Kim Eagle for acc.org, and I'm out.